Now we're looking at um, two fallacies. And fallacies are Fallacies are, are bad arguments of certain types, and we see them made over and over and over again. And they've been going on for so long that they, they have their own names. And occasionally you may see some of them called by different names in other classes or textbooks. You know, for instance, um, one of the ones we're going to look at later on is called Appeal to Popularity. Sometimes it's called Argument for Popularity. You guys might have heard of it in other classes as the bandwagon fallacy. Like, does that ring a bell with any of you? Yeah. Um, the, the basic idea behind that fallacy, the type that it has, is thinking that because, or claiming that because a lot of people believe something, it must be true. So arguments that fit that type, those are bad arguments because the mere fact that a lot of people believe something is true, that isn't good grounds for believing that something is true. There's a lot of crazy beliefs that people have had at one time or another. There are still some out there, you know. Um, and that one happens over and over and over again, and it's been discussed in, in a lot of different uh, texts. So we have a name for it. And the ones that we're going to look at today, uh, composition and division, they're fallacies too. So they are bad arguments, and they have a certain type, they have a certain structure to them. Uh, I noticed a few of you have printed out the handout that I created about composition and division. And what I do in that handout, besides giving you examples and tell you, you know, what it consists in, I give you some charts. And those charts help you to wrap your mind around what's going on in that fallacy, how the fallacy is structured um, as an argument. Right? And composition and division are often mixed up with each other. They both have to do with groups. There's another fallacy which we're going to study later on in the semester that also has to do with groups. Um, we've already talked about it a little bit, hasty generalization. These are a little bit different, and students often mistake these for each other. When I, when I give them on tests, later on I'm going to give you tests where you have to identify fallacies. You'll have a whole list of arguments, and some of them will be fallacies, and you'll have to identify this is this, is this kind of fallacy, this is that kind of fallacy. What I've noticed is um, some students who don't study, they get it all wrong, right? Because if you, if you don't know the material, you don't know the material. Students who do know the material, but know it in <clears throat> kind of an imperfect manner, um, they will, when they see something that fits the bill for these two, they will identify it as, as one of those. But often they mix them up. So they'll put composition in place of division, or division in place of composition. Sometimes students, anytime they say a group, will say, ah, oh, there must be a fallacy there. But remember, fallacies are bad arguments. You can make good arguments about groups too, right? Mm -hmm. So think about the coffee in my, in my mug. Each drop of coffee is pretty much the same as the other drops of coffee, right? And if I've stirred it. <coughs> so it's probably not the case that something that I can say about one of the drops of coffee can't also be said about the whole cup, except maybe its size. If, if one drop of coffee tastes this way or has milk in it, then you can, you can say, yeah, the whole thing does, because we assume that it's all the same. Now think about you guys. Think about you're a group, right, of students. Um, think about how different you are from each other, though. Not just physically, but in all sorts of other ways. Think about your memories. Think about your likes and dislikes, your habits. Now it's harder to go from one individual, or even a composite of all the individuals, to the whole group. Or from the whole group down to the individual. For instance, let's see, we have uh, three, uh, seven women and two men. So seven out of nine um, students in here in, in the group are female. Does that mean that any given person is seven-ninths female? 
That's not possible, I think, until, until we have some weird genetic uh, modification thing going on, you know, that the sci-fi channel likes to play with. That's not going to happen. So there's some things you can say about the group. There are properties that the group has that the, the members don't have, right? Or, again, this is sort of going a little bit further ahead, but let's say all of you are brilliant academic minds. And we're going to form one of those uh, academic bowl things where they quiz you. Um, so all of you are brilliant. Does that mean that the team that we put together is necessarily going to be brilliant? Yeah, there, there could be some problems with that. So we'll explore that sort of thinking uh, in, a, in a moment. Before we go into it, I do want to talk about where your book puts it. Um, your, your chapter three focuses on language. And language is something, uh, like many of the topics that we've got in here, when you first see the chapter heading, you think, oh, I know all about this. I've been using language my whole life. But there's a lot of little nuances to things. This chapter talks about generality and specificity. It talks about vagueness. And then it talks about something called ambiguity. Um, we're not going to go into this in detail in part because I had to cut out some material in order to, to focus more on chapter one and two. But um, your book does have some interesting discussions of the ambiguity. Ambiguity is when something can mean more than one thing at the same time. So think about a word like seal, right? What does um, what does seal mean? Well, that's that's kind of a trick question, isn't it? What's one meaning of seal? What is that? An animal. An animal, right. That's usually the first thing people think of. The animal that we see in circuses and sometimes it's playing horns or balancing a ball on its nose or, you know, we see it in National Geographic specials. What else? That's one meaning. How do you plug something up? It can be a verb talking about closing something. It can also be the noun that describes the thing that closes it. When I was a kid, they actually used to have a thing called seal a meal. Right. Um, and uh, you, you, it was before they had Ziploc bags. Uh, Ziploc actually just you know ran seal a meal out of the market. You would you would uh, put your vegetables or whatever it was you were going to put in the bag, and then you would close it and it would, you would seal it. And that was a seal, right? Uh, what else could it be? The artist. Yeah, I can refer to a guy, a single guy, who has really nothing in common with um, the ceiling that we think of. And he has nothing in common with the animal other than being a mammal, right? Um, <clears throat> so we already have a lot of different meanings to that. That's an ambiguous term, right? Another kind of ambiguity happens when you don't punctuate well, or you don't put your words together in as coherent of a fashion as you'd like to. And, and we call that um, syntactic ambiguity. Um, sometimes you can't tell what the sentence actually means. It could mean one thing or it could mean another. And you have to be very careful with this because that can get you in trouble. It can also sometimes get you out of trouble. I don't know if this story is actually true, but I, I've, I've heard this interesting story that I'll, I'll use to, to illustrate it. There was a guy in Russia and he had a death sentence. And um, the governor of the province had the right to grant clemency. Just like a governor in the, you know, in the United States, if you're, on, if you're on death row, you're pardon. And he heard this guy's case, and then he wrote, uh, and he was at his house because he had a home office, he wrote, um, pardon impossible to be executed. Bad news for that guy. Pardon impossible to be executed. Now, his wife came along and she was kind of tender hearted. And all she did was change the, the place of the comma. And that saved the guy's life. Put the comma here, now how does it read? Pardon impossible to be executed. And notice, 
very small difference there, right? That meant the difference between life and death for this guy. A lot of cases like that. So, you know, when your teachers are, are busting on you for, um, and you get a lot of red ink saying, this sentence is unclear, your sentence might be something like this. And, and you know, in college it doesn't really matter that much. But when you're in real life, and you're dealing with people's money, or people's lives, or classification of whether somebody is a, um, a threat, or insane, or, you know, needs assistance, or something like that, it makes a big difference. Uses of which, that, um, those can introduce a lot of ambiguity. Your book also talks about something called grouping ambiguity. And it gives you this nice example that I, I really like. Um, secretaries make more Start saying, oh, what kind of doctors? You know, you're a doctor, Dr. Sadler. We don't mean that. We mean um, Physician. physicians. <clears throat> now, is this true or false? False. It is false in one sense. <coughs> it's also true in another sense. At least right now. It might, might not be, you know, 20 years from now. Now, if you thought that it was false, then you were probably thinking of individual secretaries and individual doctors, right? Yeah. Now, does an individual secretary make more than an individual doctor? No, doctors make a lot of money as an individual. But... Use it as a group? Like yes, as a group. exactly. Now, think about how many secretaries there are compared to how many doctors. Every doctor's got a secretary to begin with. Sometimes more than one. How many other secretaries are there? A lot. A lot. Yeah, there's probably, I don't, I, I, I don't want to say millions, because I don't know that to be true. But I know there's at least hundreds of thousands of secretaries. When we have, just in the United States, we have about 300 million people. So, I mean, it actually could be the case that a million of them are secretaries. There aren't that many doctors. So, as a whole, the secretaries could actually make more than, than the doctors when you put them all together. Now, it matters which way you read it, doesn't it? This is where people get into arguments quite often. Somebody will say something like this, and, and then you say, ah, that's false. And they say, I know it's right. I've got the statistics. And, and you're talking past each other, right? Because you're interpreting it in two different ways. You're not actually talking about exactly the same thing. With composition and division, What's happening is we're going from groups down to the, the parts of the groups, or the members, uh, or we're going from the, the members on up to the, the whole. So let me give you another sort of chart or diagram. You can reason, and you do this all the time, you can reason from a whole or a group down to parts or members. And that, that you know, any, any whole has certain properties. It has things you can say about it, right? Think about the classroom that we have right here. You guys are a group. There's 10 of you now um, in this class. The attendance is very low today for some reason. <laughs> I don't, don't know. Yeah, it's Friday. But, um, I mean, you can't take every Friday off in the semester. Some students do though, don't they? Um, so we have 10 students here, and you're a group. You're, you're my class. That's the kind of group that you are. Um, you are all, there are certain properties we can say of all of you. You're all enrolled in critical thinking. That's why you're here, right? That's part of what constitutes that group. That's something that's true of the group, and it's also true of the members. You're studying critical thinking. You're a student who's enrolled at, at Fayetteville State University. Those are things that are true of the parts, and they're also true of the whole, that's this, this group. Um, now, can we say that about everything? No, there's some things. Um, major. Okay, yeah, major. 
Um, I would be, I would suspect that at least two of you in here have the same major, given given the um, way statistics work. <clears throat> Um, I would be very surprised to find out that all of you had the same major. Unless you were in a learning community where we, we flock people in based on their major. Um, so each one of you has a property of majoring in this or majoring in that. The whole doesn't actually have that, does it? So if we were to say, um, oh, here's a, here's a good one with that. Each one of you has one or two majors, right? Are any of you double majoring? No. That's kind of tough to do. I did that when I was in, in undergrad. Um, but I picked two things that fit closely together, philosophy and mathematics. Um, there are some double majors here at FSU. Some are really disparate. Sociology and criminal justice. Yeah, those work good. I know somebody who's majoring in history and theater. No overlap in the classes at all. Um, that's, that's kind of tough to do. So each one of you has one major, we'll say. One or two majors. Does that mean that the whole group does? The group probably has eight or nine different majors. Uh, or think about FSU students as a whole. Um, FSU, at FSU you can study about 30 or 40 different majors, depending on how you want to count them. There's some specializations. So there's some ambiguity about that, what counts as a major, too, right? Let's say it's 30. You can study 30 different majors here at FSU. Does that mean that any given student is studying 30 different subjects? No. Or we offer, I don't know how many, I know how many courses, how many class sections we offer. It's somewhere around 1,200 uh, per semester, I think. I don't know how many courses we offer. Let's say it's um, 500. FSU offer, FSU has 500 courses that people are studying this semester. How many can any of you study? What's the max, you think? Seven. Yeah, I mean, if you're doing seven, that's a lot of coursework, right? So again, the whole and the parts don't necessarily share all of the same properties. Um, when we make mistakes with this, we can go from the parts or the members to the whole, or we can go from the whole, the group, down to the parts and the members. This is where it gets a little tricky and where students get these mixed up a bit. But I have some mnemonic devices, some ways to remember this that I think would, would work for you. Um, if you're going from a whole down to parts, are you composing it or are you dividing it? You're dividing it, right. Division is when you're going from the whole or the group down to the parts of the members and when they don't actually share that property. You're saying that they do share the property, they don't actually share the property. That's why, that's why it's a fallacy. If they actually do share the property, it's not a fallacy of division. Um, but if they, if they don't share it, then it can be. And the way that I think you can remember this, um, all of you like pie, right? Of one sort or another? You don't like pie? Any, any kind of pie? I don't like sweets. Oh, well, that, this might not work for you then. But you can think of dividing other things. Well, you could have meat pie. My, uh, <laughs> my, uh, my family's French Canadian, and we, uh, one of the things that we have in our gatherings is called a tutsiai. And it's uh, a meat pie, which is, which is made with uh, veal and pork and beef. And it's cooked in a pie shell, and it's, it's just something we eat. It's really good. Pie. We'll there you go. Pot pie is a, a pie too, yeah. So everybody, everyone likes pie. So if you have a pie and you are cutting it into pieces, what are you doing? You are dividing. You're going from a whole that you already have, the whole pie, down to its parts. Now, of course, if you're eating the whole pie, you might not do that, but um, that would have to be a fair. You know, like a pot pie, right? You eat the whole pot pie. You're probably not going to sit down and eat the entire French silk pie. Or if you do, you might get sick, right? Uh, usually you divide it and you share it. Now composition then is going the other way. And how can you remember this? Well, what's a composition in music? Piece. Piece, right. A whole. 
a unity. And what does the composer actually do? They bring together a whole bunch of parts. Some of the parts are just individual notes, aren't they? Some of them are actually literally parts. If you're doing uh, part singing, you have a soprano and an alto. And yeah, it, it depends on whether you're doing three part or four part. If you're doing four part, you have a tenor and a bass. If you're doing a four part, you have a, a baritone, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, now, if you're doing a whole symphony, you have the clarinet part, and the trumpet part, and the cymbal part, and all these things. And the composer brings them together in some sort of unity. So think of composition. Or, um, sometimes your, your English classes, what are they sometimes called? Composition, right. And what are you doing in that? You are writing things. And what are you doing when you're writing? You're actually composing. You may not think of it that way. But you're taking a lot of words that you know, putting them into holes. Yeah, and you're actually doing it in a couple different levels. The lowest hole that you work with is the sentence. And then sentences make paragraphs. And then paragraphs make, they might make sections if you're doing a long paper, or they make the whole paper. What you're doing is you're composing. Um, you're actually doing that too when you cook. If you, if you thought, but that may not help you remember this. Although, cooking is good for illustrating the fallacies here. So let me give you a few examples from cooking. Think about, let's think about different kinds of foods first. Think about um, a salad. What are you doing when you're making a salad? You're putting a lot of kinds of things together. Usually it's going to be based on lettuce in some way or another. And you, you know, you maybe tear the lettuce, or you cut it up, and then you add some other things to it that you like, um, like you might put olives in, or you know, radishes, or onions, or who knows, green pepper. Yeah, you're not actually modifying the bits of it that much, are you? you and you're going to put some sort of dressing usually, unless you're really, really, um, you know, into the taste of lettuce by itself. Not too many people are. And you might make the dressing yourself, you know, or you might just buy it. But you're adding all those things together. You're putting them together in a whole. Um, now, the salad as a whole tastes pretty good. Probably all the parts that you put in it taste good too, right? Otherwise you wouldn't put them in there. That's not going to involve a fallacy here, though. Remember, a fallacy is a bad argument. What would make it into a bad argument if the parts don't actually have the quality that the whole does? If you're making the salad, you want to make a salad that you like. So let's, let's say I restrict you to three ingredients. Lettuce, and what else do you guys want to put in it? Cucumbers. Cucumbers, what else? Tomatoes. Tomatoes, okay. So, lettuce, cucumber, tomato salad. You like, let's assume that everybody here likes all of those things. Um, you like the parts, they taste good to you, the salad as a whole tastes good to you. There's no fallacy there, because you're not saying uh, something where the parts have a quality and the whole doesn't have that quality. So what's the bad argument then? Well, I'm going to give you one. Now think about making cake. Making cake is very different than making salad, isn't it? And imagine you're not using cake mix, because cake mix, um, there's only really two or three ingredients. They were actually designed, there's a long story about that. If I have time, I'll tell you that. That's kind of funny. Um, they were designed to make people feel like they were doing something. Um, it was an old advertising trick. If you're making a cake from scratch, what do you need? Uh, flour, sugar, egg, sugar, salt. Uh, salt. What makes it rise usually? Yeast. Yeah, you could use yeast in, in some cakes. Usually it's more often baking powder. Yeah. Uh, well, so what else, are we missing anything? Sometimes oil, right? Some sort of yeah. butter, shortening, or, or just oil. Are you missing anything? Water. Yeah, you have to put some water in <laughs> or milk. Um, okay. So you've got all these parts. And um, do all those parts taste good by themselves? No. Sugar does. What doesn't taste good by itself? Wow. Yeah, well, there, actually, there are some people who like to eat flour out of the package, but that's kind of rare. Um, baking soda doesn't Yeah, baking soda is pretty, pretty awful. Um, oil by itself is not good. 
That's true. A raw egg. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we've got quite a few parts that have a property of not tasting good. The whole does have the property of tasting good, though, doesn't it? I mean, if you make the cake right. If, if, if you didn't, then it might not taste so hot. But let's assume that you're cooking it well. Um, all the parts actually do taste good. That's a quality that the whole has. The parts don't all have that quality. So if you're arguing from the parts to the whole, you could be committing the fallacy of composition. If you're going from the fact that all the parts of the cake taste good, imagine a little kid now, right? A little kid is... is Seen that his, his or her parent um, making cake before, and they've, they've had the cake, and they love cake, the way most kids do, right? And they, they go to the cupboard while mom or dad is still asleep, and they start pulling out things, because what are they going to do? They're going to make a cake. And of course, they're going to eat stuff while they're doing it, because that's what kids do. That kid is, is reasoning, hey, that cake tastes really good. All the stuff that goes into it is going to taste really good, too. So they uh, get a spoonful and try some flour. Doesn't taste good. Well, they've committed the fallacy of division in their reasoning. Um, they've said something about the whole that doesn't actually apply to the parts. Um, so that would be a fallacy of the composition since you're mixing it all together. Composition would be if you start from the parts and you say all of these parts well, let's think of something where you could mix it together and the parts taste good, but the whole may not taste good. Um, what are some things you like that are probably incompatible with each other? They're incompatible? Yeah. You all like chocolate, right? Although chocolate can go with just about almost anything, it turns out. You can go with chili pepper and sea salt. You can, can use all potatoes this. and chocolate? Yeah, that would work. I, that sounds disgusting. Uh, although, you know, it could turn out to be tasty. We should try it sometime. But mashed potatoes, okay. Uh, let's add something else to it, like maybe cheese, right? Mashed potatoes and cheese. Yeah, cheddar cheese will make it. Strong taste. Uh, cheddar cheese tastes good. Mashed potatoes taste good. Chocolate tastes good. We'll put them all together, and, and whatever we're going to call this dish. Um, we need something a little catchy, I think, you know. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna market that and say this is gonna be so tasty. What we'll do is we'll actually show a commercial with somebody saying, you know, mashed potatoes. You love cheese. You love chocolate. Try the thing that brings these great tastes together. Um, it's probably gonna be disgusting. So it's not gonna have the same quality that the parts do. Um, so so cooking shows us great examples of um, holes and parts that don't always share the same properties. Something else it does is sports teams. Right? Sports teams or other, other organizations where people have to come together and work for a common goal. Like a, a musical band. Or what else would be like that? Um, maybe other kinds of teams. Projects. Teams that work on projects in, in, in businesses. If you have all the best players, will that give you the best team? It should, but not necessarily. Um, and if you, if you think about it, where does that come in? Where does it not necessarily come in? What could go wrong? Might get injured. Yeah, although that could apply to anybody, right? Um, think, their think, egos. What's that? Their egos. Yeah, this is this is a big problem. When you have star players, star players usually have star level egos too, and that can make it difficult for them to function together. Um, every, every, I can fail a drug test, eh? Well, yeah, although anybody can fail a drug test, you know, if, they, if they're uh, doing the wrong things, right? They don't have to be a good player, they could be a bad player and fail the drug test. <laughs> then they won't get uh, brought back, though, you know. Um, yeah, egos could get in the way. Um, so that could be a problem. Everybody wants to have the ball. What else, though? What makes a team function well besides getting along with each other? They follow out the procedures as far as um... you're on the right track. Um, the layout, I mean. Yeah. When if you think about say I don't know about baseball, but if you think about football, basketball, um, 
Soccer has this too, although I don't know what they call them. Hockey, they at least do something sort of similar to this. You have what they call plays. And in football, the whole, the whole thing is plays, right? You line up and you know, run at each other and you know, try to tackle the guy. Um, in basketball, things are a little bit more fluid, but you still have plays. You know, this person has to go over here, and then this person has to go here, and this person has to set the pick, and the ball is going to go from this guy to this guy to this guy who's under the basket, right? What does it take to make that work? Can you just throw a bunch of guys together and say, all right, go at it? I mean, you could, but it's not going to turn out very well, is it? What do you actually need? Teamwork. Teamwork. Right. Teamwork and practice. practice. Those are things that go into the composition of a team, a good team, that aren't there in the parts by themselves. Now, the individual player, of course, can practice their plays. Right? Um, football players, I know, they're given playbooks and they have to study them and you know, memorize all these things. But that's not the same thing as actually being on the field and you doing your thing while these other people are doing their thing, is it? Or now let's think about music. Um, a good band, whether it's you know, um, you know, rock and roll or hip hop or whatever you want, or if you think about like a marching band or a symphony, they have to have that sort of cohesiveness too, don't they? If they're going to work well, they actually have to listen to each other. Because in a marching band, you take the wrong step, everybody. <laughs> yeah. I hated marching band when I was a kid. Um, I used to, I played, my first real instrument was a clarinet. And um, that wasn't bad. I quit, I quit playing it when I realized we couldn't really do much of, of anything with it, with the kind of music I liked, and I switched to bass guitar. Um, and, uh, but you had to march. And the worst thing was, I mean, look how tall I am. I'm six foot three. So when I take a step, it's not the same step as, uh, you know, how tall are you? Like five, four. Okay, it's not going to be anything like the, the sort of step um, that, that she takes. And so I was having a really hard time staying in, in time and not stepping on the people in front of me. And, oh, it was awful. Um, but, you know, if you're the right size and you're fairly coordinated, which I wasn't when I was a, a kid, um, then marching band can be pretty good. And you notice there are some marching bands, and they're like clockwork, aren't they? That's because something has gone into that composition, into that hole. Some other qualities have been developed for that hole that weren't there in the parts by themselves. Sometimes the hole is greater than the sum of the parts. You've all heard that expression? So, if you were to say, everybody has studied their playbook inside and out, everybody knows their plays, does that mean the whole team knows their plays? Not until they actually get out there and practice. Or everybody's practiced their parts for the song. Does that mean that, that and their parts sound good when they sing it to themselves? How many of you have been in, in singing at one point or another? And, and, and what's it like when everybody has their, their parts down, but they haven't actually practiced together? Yeah, because they're, they're not actually meshing yet. It takes a little time to, to fit together. It's sort of like that process of cooking, isn't it? The eggs, the milk, the, the butter, the uh, baking soda. If, if you just have that batter, the batter is okay. It's not as good as the cake. It, something happens to it in the process. Um, now you can also go the other way, right? We, when we go from division, go from the whole or the group down to the members. Green Bay Packers won the Super Bowl, so they're the best team. Does that mean that every single player is, is the best player in their position in the league? That's, that's never the case, is it? I, I don't think you ever see a team, an individual <coughs> team, where every one of the players is absolutely the best. Talent just isn't you know, concentrated that, that, um, that well. Uh, even when you have dream teams, you know, like the, the Chicago Bulls back in the um, uh, 80s and 90s. They had a lot of really good players. They still had some players that, that needed to sit on the bench, right? That they would trade the next year. Um, so if you were to say the team is really good, therefore all of the players are really good, you're probably committing the fallacy of, of uh, division.
tradition. There's other things that you can say about holes too. <clears throat> For instance, how long have the Carolina Panthers been in, in North Carolina? Anyone know? I think it's a, something like 12 years maybe. No, Does it ring a bell? Since the 90s? Yeah. Maybe it's a little bit longer, maybe it's 15 years. Um, does that mean that any individual player has been here for 15 years? No. No. So the team has a sort of unity over time that the parts don't have. You know what else is like that? Your body. I'm 40 years old. Right? So I've been around on this earth for 40, 40 years and some days. Um, quite a few actually, because my birthday is back in, in August. So I'm uh, August what? August 18th. Um, as a matter of fact, my, my daughter's birthday is exactly six months spaced out from mine. Hers is uh, February 18th. So I'm going to be 40 and a half very soon. Oh, no, that's today, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Real? So I'm 40. So I'm 40 and a half. Oh no, I've already yeah, I've already sent her her present on uh, its way. Um, now. Does that mean that any of the parts of my body are actually 40 and a half years old? No. No. Well, the bones. Some of the bone structure is. Um, but none of those cells are. Those cells are at most seven years old. Because that's the longevity, so the scientists tell us, of a cell. So all the cells in my eye are not the same cells as I had seven years ago. My, my skin is not the same skin as I had seven years ago. For each one of the parts, those parts cannot be 40 years old. The whole can't be. The human body is sort of like this, um, this thing called Theseus' ship. Um, there, there's an old philosophical puzzle. Uh, there was a guy, Theseus, and he was um, a Greek hero. And I don't know why the ship thing is, is attributed to him. But imagine you've got a ship, and you're on a long, long voyage, and things break down on your ship, right? So what do you do when they break down? Fix them. And now th imagine it's an old ship. So fixing doesn't mean, you know, tinkering with the metal. There's no metal, except maybe nails or something like that in the ship. What do you do? You, you pull yourself ashore, and you find a tree, and you cut it down, and you make a new plank out of it, and you replace the old plank that broke. Now man can do this over and over and over again until none of the original pieces of wood on the ship are are left. They've all been replaced at one time or another. The ship has remained in existence, hasn't it, over time. Is it the same ship? Sure. It's okay. Um, no in one sense, because why? All the parts are new. All the parts are new. Or, or, the, or maybe several times replaced, right? Um, but it is the same ship in another way, isn't it? Because that whole has remained the same over time. So is that composition the same? Well, if you were to say the ship has, if you were to say that the ship has remained in existence over time, therefore all the parts have, that would be division, because you're going from the whole to the parts. If you were to say all the parts are new, therefore the ship is new, um, you would be committing the fallacy of composition. So that's yeah. part of what I'm saying about the one about the anthem. Which one? Um, God, I forgot. What was the one before that? About teams? Yeah. Why is it the fallacy of division, not composition? Well, it, it only depends on which way you're going. If you're going, if you're talking about the team, then you're concluding that because the team is better. Oh, because you started off talking about the team first. Exactly. What makes it a fallacy is, is um, that it's a bad argument that they don't share the same qualities. And what makes it this fallacy or that fallacy. So the argument starts as talking about the whole of the division. Yes. And if it starts talking about individual or pieces, it's going to be composition. Yes. So it's the way it starts. It's what it starts from and what it's going to. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Dr. Sala, did you say we were going to have to um, point to the composition division out of a sentence? Yes. Could you do one and see if we can pull it out? Oh, what I was saying is that you're going to have to be able to identify cases where you, you see. So if I say something, like a lot of these examples I've been giving to you. Um, the Carolina Panthers have been in North Carolina for 15 years. Therefore, 
what, what's one of the players' names? I don't follow the Panthers. What's that? Steve Smith. Therefore, Steve Smith has been in North Carolina for 15 years, talking about one of the parts. Um, you would want to identify that as a fallacy of division. Okay. Right? Um, you can also do that, too, by the way, with teams. You could do that with geographical locations. Um, the Packers are from where? Green Bay. Green Bay. Are, are any of the players actually from Green Bay? Probably not. I don't think so. There might be, but uh, none of the ones I can think of. Um, so again, the whole doesn't always have the same property as the parts. So that would again be a fallacy of... So you said... Um, each of the teammates on the Green Bay Packers are from Green Bay. That would be fast composition. Well, the team actually is from Green Bay. Yeah, there wouldn't be any problem with that. Let's say you said all the teammates on the Green Bay Packers are from Chicago. Oh, that would be um, composition. Exactly. And therefore, the Green Bay Packers are from Chicago oh, okay. as a whole. That's not the case. They're from, from Green Bay. <coughs> or you could say, here's a good one. The Green Bay Packers are, are, are known for being the team that's owned by the fans. It's the only team that's not owned by an individual. Um, does that mean that any of the players are actually owned by somebody? No. Do we allow that here in, in the states anymore since uh, the Emancipation Proclamation? No. no. Um, so that you know that would be one of those qualities that the whole could have, but the parts couldn't possibly have. Or think about a company. A company could be owned by somebody. Does that mean that if you work for that company, somebody owns you? I hope not. Might be owned. <laughs> You're right. It might. Um, yeah. Now, there, what's that? Was that a fallacy of division? That was division. Which one? About the oh, the if, if uh, the company is owned by somebody, like say Fox is owned by Rupert Murdoch, right? Nobody at Fox is actually owned by Rupert Murdoch. But Let's say Rupert Murdoch is walking around and he says, uh, you. you work for me. I own you. Uh, I own your company. I own you. He would be committing the fallacy of division. Um, hopefully he doesn't do that. I don't, I don't know because I, I don't know anybody who works at Fox. Are you going to open up the white board for you this new Monday? Uh, yeah. It wasn't open yesterday. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't put it together yet. Oh, okay. That's why. Um, but yeah, we'll be putting together a quiz dealing with um, composition and division. One of the things you want to keep in mind, too, is not just figuring out which way it's going, but the, the whole key here is, is the property actually shared? Sometimes the property will be shared. You know, a single drop of rain um, compared to a bucket of rain, they're probably going to have most of the properties that they have in common except for size. Or um, any, any homogenous thing like that, sand on a beach, right? One clump of sand, it's pretty much going to be the same as a bucket full of sand, or the same as a truckload of sand. So the holes in the parts could be, could be similar. Or think about um, more complicated holes that are made of one material. Like what about salt and... Um, oh yeah, salt is... is and uh, water. Yeah, oh, if you put them together? The ocean water, yeah. If there's salt in the ocean, would that be something that you could say share the same property? Uh, the ocean is salty, the salt is salty, the water by itself is not salty if you take the salt out. Um, so I'm looking at salt in the property and it can be a different thing, does that mean they have the same property? <coughs> well, it depends on what you're trying to say. If you were saying something like, um, let's say we're going to go from the group, the, the, the ocean, ocean water. Ocean water is salty, therefore everything in ocean water is salty. If you break it up, like you take the salt out and you take the, the water out, the water by itself wouldn't be salty, then, would it? Um, so that would be fallacy of division. So. All right, I will see all of you.